This is the very first of our Thoughtful Faith Community sessions, and we are beginning with two weeks in a row um, discussing and exploring if God cares about injustice. It's a question I think that is of great relevance right now. Um, it's always of great relevance, but right now we're in a time when we're struggling with some specific issues of justice, and, and I think this is... Um, good time for this conversation. We are joined by Dr. Mark Biddle, and he is not a stranger to us at River Road. We have enjoyed his leadership on earlier occasions. We know him as seminary professor and Old Testament scholar and friend, and it is our privilege to have you with us tonight, Mark. We're very glad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad that you all are here, and I would love to take an opportunity to open in a word of prayer. For time gathered in community, for time to place attention on you, and time to be challenged, we give thanks, oh God. We pray this evening for brothers and sisters in need, specifically, asking that you will be with those who are grieving and hurting, fearful and struggling, each according to their needs. We ask that you would care for our loved ones. Forgive anything that is in us that doesn't bring peace and love into your world. And we pray that you would move us towards better living towards sowing peace and love as we go. God, we ask that you would guide Dr. Biddle, that you would guide our hearing and our interaction with one another, our conversation, and that within us you would create openness to wrestle with your word. Help this time to allow us to be more prepared to deal with the lives that we find ourselves in. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. All right. Well, Dr. Biddle, we are looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation. Um, let me tell you what we're going to do for two weeks uh, right up front. Um, whenever anyone asks me to talk about just about any topic, uh, my first inclination is to think in terms of biblical foundations, as you might not be surprised to hear. And when I hear that I have two weeks, uh, that means I think of the Old Testament and then the New. Um, I am, was an Old Testament professor for many years, but at two graduate levels, I minored in New Testament. Don't tell anybody. Shh. Uh, that's a secret. So this tonight, and we're going to, and by the way, boy, as soon as I decided that and the topic of justice, and I think about the Old Testament, and I think we've got about 20, 25 minutes, and then some questions. I almost threw my hands in the air and ran, ran away and hid somewhere. That's, that's impossible. So what I'm going to do, and it's against my scholarly nature to do it this way, I'm going to make some statements without significantly substantiating them. And that's against my nature. Um, because if I took the time to significantly substantiate them, I wouldn't get very far. Uh, so I'm going to make a statement, and then I'm going to hint at why I think the Bible suggests that, the Old Testament in this case. And then I'm going to go on. If you want substantiation, later I can offer it, as long as it's not on every point. There are five of these points, and I'm going to do them quickly, and then I'm, we're going to look, if you want to get your Bible ready, at Ezekiel chapter 18 a chapter in the prophetic literature, which I think illustrates all the points I'm about to make as well as any chapter does. You can entitle this chapter in, in Ezekiel. It almost has the title of its own. What is justice? Okay, so I'll start out with a general observation about what we typically think of when we use the term justice. We talk about our justice system 
And we frequently say, I want, or so-and-so deserves justice. Well, I want justice for my friend. Or I want so-and-so demands justice for. We, we tend to use that word in a very restricted sense, um, which is not suitable to scripture at all. We tend to use it basically to mean retribution. When we say we want justice for name someone, we typically mean that we want the bad guy to be punished or if someone's been unjustly, unfairly accused or even incarcerated, we want them set free. Our justice system, in other words, tends to hinge around imprisonment or in some cases fines, punishment. When we say I want justice, we tend to mean I want the right person to be punished. That's not biblical at all. Um, I'm going to mention, as I said, I'm going to make five lesser contrasts, but think about that against the background of a, of a way of thinking of justice purely in terms of punishing the right person or persons. Uh, I think that in contrast to the way we operate in our world today, the Bible would, for example, emphasize community over the individual. Uh, you hear a lot about hyper-individualism today and about how hyper-individualistic our culture is. I'm afraid it's true. I tell my students often that when you're asking an either-or question, someone's asking you typically to make a mistake. Am I Mark Biddle the individual, or am I Mark Biddle who is a father and a son and a brother and a husband and a member of a church and part of a community and a teacher of all those alumni out there of I've taught. I don't belong just to me, do I? You don't belong just to you. And the ancient Israelites understood that in ways which we don't seem to have quite understood, which means <coughs> that justice is going to have a communitarian component. I said I would mention a biblical passage or concept to hint at why I think this is true. And in this case, I would mention simply the Exodus. God did not deliver Moses or Aaron or one family. God delivered a whole people to be his people. Does God care about George and Sue or does God care about George or Sue or does God care about George Anson. Justice is not an individual, solely individual thing. Number two, the Old Testament, I think, would emphasize responsibility over rights. The whole notion of human rights and our rights, you know, is an enlightenment idea. And it's based, I think, in a hyper-individualism mixed with greed. Um, when we insist upon our, our rights, we are saying that what I need and want, or think I need and want, trumps anything anybody else in the whole world needs or wants. And, and that's simply not bi biblical. The biblical understanding of things is rather about our each of our responsibility to love and do for, I think of Micah, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. The example I would give for this, by the way, in the, in the Old Testament is the whole book of Numbers and Leviticus. I know we Christians just don't really get off on Numbers and Leviticus too much. But if you read it carefully, you'll begin to notice a common theme. And that is that the priests were always interested in, in well, let's take property, for example. We, we, we talk about property rights a lot. In ancient Israel, they understood the land of Israel, the promised land, to be God's gift to them. They didn't own it. 
which meant the apportionment that you had been allotted was yours to exercise stewardship over. You couldn't sell it. The most you could do was be rented out for six years because in every seventh year, in every Sabbath year, it automatically reverted back to its original owner, its original steward. So this whole notion of rights to property was not something upon which ancient Israel built its society. They thought of themselves rather as all God's people, all sharing in the bounty of God's good land. And it was more about responsibility to that land and to one another. Uh, it, so far, it went so far as to include the responsibility of a kinsperson uh, to buy back land for a relative who had fallen on hard times without expectation of being repaid. So Old Testament justice is more about community than individual. It's more about responsibility to others than it is upon insisting on my own rights. It's more about rest restoration than it is about retribution. To go back to those priestly texts in Numbers and Leviticus, uh, there is, it's often, uh, Hebrew has this word shalom, you know it, you've heard it, which people translate often peace, which is kind of right, but not really. Shalom describes the situation in which everything is in balance, as it should be. A community in which everyone is interrelating properly, and there are no economic or other kinds of imbalances. That, that is shalom. A state of well-being. I always think it's important. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers. I always wondered why we called them peacekeepers. We send the UN in there to stand in between two, army, two warring parties so that they can't shoot at each other. That's not keeping peace. There's no peace there. Peace is when there's... So... The Old Testament, the book of Le Numbers and Leviticus, is full of discussions about the shalom offering, the peace offering. And it always involves some way of restoring and repaying and reestablishing a relationship that has been broken by someone's misbehavior. You very rarely read in the Bible of any sort of punitive measures taken that don't involve actually a restoration or an attempt at restoration. You know, think about it. What good does it do in our culture, the way we deal with it, a young person steals something and we send them to jail? The, the, the stolen property doesn't get returned. There's no restoration for the injured party. And the, the kid, the young person who goes off to jail is going to go off to jail and learn how to be a criminal. There's not much restoration going on. The Old Testament concept of justice is more about action than about status. We, we talk about someone as being righteous, and in some circles, that's not necessarily a, a compliment uh, because self-righteousness is, is a nasty thing. Righteousness is not a quality you possess. It's a way of behaving. I already cited Micah 6.8. Do justice. Love mercy. Justice is something you do. And then finally, and this actually is fundamental. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, justice is about relationship, not about rules. The, my favorite text in this regard is, a, is not often taught or preached because it's well, touch us a little bit. And that's the story of Judah and Tamar. 
Do you all know that story? Shake your head up and down if you do. The story in which uh, Judah uh, had given his, had married off his oldest son to, to Tamar and, and he died. And then he, according to the Leveret law in the Old Testament, he married off the next son to Judah and he died. Uh, and not to Tamar, and he died. And so Judah concluded Tamar must be a jinx or something, a witch or bad luck. And he sent her home. Years passed, and it became apparent to Tamar that Judah had no intention of fulfilling his responsibility. And so she um, set up camp, set up shop as a temporary prostitute. This is why you don't hear this in church that often. And, and tricked Judah. She, he didn't know who she was. He didn't recognize her. She got his signet ring and his staff. Later on, Judah her, hears that Tamar is pregnant. And according to the rules, she has prostituted herself and deserved to be stoned to death. And he sets about to do that. When she produces the signet ring and the staff that he had given as a pledge, and that's when Judah says, Tamar, you are more tzaddik, is the Hebrew. You are more just. You are more righteous than I have. Because you have shown faithfulness to your dead husband. So, in this case, a very complicated situation according to all the ins and outs of Israelite society. <coughs> Judah, uh, Tamar pushed the envelope, but in doing so, she was more faithful to the relationship she had to Judah's family than Judah had been himself. And Judah had the, had the good sense and the character to recognize it, should have recognized it sooner. Throughout the Bible, people are judged to be tzaddik, typically not in relationship to a law or a norm, but typically in, in terms of their uprightness in relationship. Well, I said all that. Let's look at Ezekiel 18 and see what we find in the biblical text that pretty much defines for the ancient Israelite anyway, what righteousness is. Well, by the way, righteousness, justice. The same word, you, you know, in Hebrew, you pay your money, take your pick. You can translate it either way. Uh, it, it means the same thing. Righteousness, I'm afraid, in English has gotten, gotten, a, gotten, to be a bum, gotten a bum rap. You can't use it without thinking about some sort of religious spirituality stuff. It means rightness, being and doing what is right. Just as justice, justice is a strange word. We use the closest, we talk about uh, justifying the right margin of a document we print out, by which we mean lining it up straight. And, and, that's what we're talking about, doing things straight up in relation to other people. Now, let's read. If a man is righteous, just, upright, however you want to translate, and does what is lawful and right, okay, if he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman during her menstrual period. That's Old Testament for you. Does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge. Commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment does not take advance or accrued interest, withholds his hand from iniquity, 
executes true justice between contending parties. There's, see, the relationship thing. Follows my statues, statutes and is careful to observe my ordinances, acting faithfully. Such a one is righteous. He shall surely live, says the Lord God. Now, it goes on, if you want to read verses 10 and following, to state the opposite. But that to read that would be overkill. If you if you do the opposite of this, you're you're in unjust. You're not righteous. You're you don't promote shalom. Several things in that text, by the way, probably I hope stood out to you. One is the thing about interest. The Old Testament is very clear about this: that when in the in the ancient world. Uh, you would take out a loan probably when you were in financial trouble. And if you want to read further on this, I suggest Deuteronomy chapter 15. The Old Testament is, is insist that one in, a, one in a, in a position of advantage, not take advantage of someone who is in a, in a disadvantaged position. Deuteronomy, says, Deuteronomy 15 says, if there's someone poor among you and they need a loan, I'm paraphrasing, give it to them. Don't charge interest. Give them what you can afford to give. Don't think about the year of the Sabbath year in which the debt will be forgiven anyway. Give it to them because they need it and you have it. Do not be stingy. And Deuteronomy says, because you should remember that the Lord God delivered you from Egyptian bondage. Now, I hope that was a, that was quick. I hope it was coherent. If it's not, I'll try to cohere it for you in this question and answer period. I'm just thinking in the light of today, you know, of... Uh the goings on today between um, the black community and the police community. And if we're talking about, you know, community and justice for a community and we're, we're the two are still our community, of, you know, of America. Um, how do we bring that into balance? Yeah. I mean, this, look, <laughs> <laughs> when you ask me a question like that, you'll probably get some preaching. I mean, Amos can come out in me in a half a second, but I'll try to keep him under check a little bit. The thing I would point out a couple, a couple of things about this uh, situation in respect to what I've talked about. One is I'm not sure that America today sees itself as one community. And, and that, that is a fundamental problem. I'm not sure. I do know. Uh, I've been thinking about this uh, for a while now. I don't remember when it started, but I've been thinking about it for eight or nine years now and I've written about it a little bit. And now I'm to the point where I hate the rights word. Because anytime somebody ins has to insist on their rights or does so, it automatically drives a wedge between mm -hmm. folks. It suggests that the only way I think I can be treated fairly is by insisting on my rights because you, you, whoever who you are, doesn't see me as part of the community and won't do the res exercise your responsibility in relationship. Uh, are you following what I'm saying? I think I think, boy, here I go, get ready. <laughs> I think that over the last while, at least my lifetime and a period before, the church has not stood up for these things. We have not demonstrated that we're more about love than we are about insisting on rights. We have, we have done a lot, in fact, to sustain the status quo when it was patently unjust. 
I'll only cite one example. I don't want to start a war here this evening. But when I was growing up in the deep south, um, I was in a church where they preached about Jesus' love every Sunday. And we sang, Jesus loves the little children, red and yellow, black and white. But when, as a young teenager, I suggested that we could go into the neighborhood just a block or two down at vacation Bible school time and bring some of those children who were darker than I am to vacation Bible school, I was, I was quieted. I was hushed. That they have their church, let them go to it, right? That was, the, that was the early 1970s. That was not forever ago. I think um, that the church has an opportunity here to demonstrate that at the core of justice is love for the other person, regardless of who that other person is. And that it, that love for the other that exercise of our brotherly and sisterly responsibility. Um, yeah, that will make a difference. Rather than insisting on my rights, thank you. Um, I'm trying to wrap my head around the idea that in the Old Testament it was all about community. And yet, and in this country, you know, it was about individual liberty, um, the life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, inalienable rights that we had. Um, I'm thinking that we have such a totally different place of origin for rights. Um, yeah, you're nodding your head. So I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think how do, yeah, how, do you, <laughs> how, how are we today? look at this Old Testament concept of community as opposed to individuality. Right. Okay. A couple of things. One is you've, you've, you've all, you've run the risk of pushing my scholarly button there. So be careful because, um, uh, this, 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 the, the, the declaration of independence is an enlightenment document, boy, straight up and down without, um, uh, the Leviathan by, was it Hobbes or Locke? John Locke's Leviathan. I think it was. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have a Declaration of Independence. And um, that, that document arose out of that time period when ph philosophically uh, people were deists. They didn't believe in a personal God much anymore. They believed in a mechanic, mechanistic universe. And they were looking for, uh, us, you know, um, the, the whole social contract thing arises out of the notion that we're all individuals who would just as soon kill and rape and murder and steal from the other one to get our, our own advantage. But we entered into a social contract in which we said, I will limit my aggression if you will limit your aggression and we'll try to get along together, even though what we'd really like to do is trample each other. Right. <laughs> uh, and that, 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 that basis of a whole society and a community in individual greed and rapaciousness which is the underlying uh, basis for post-enlightenment thought, is to me um, depressing. You know, I don't want to be part of that human race. If it's all about uh, the only reason you're not killing me is because I might kill you back first. <laughs> you know, and that's that's that sucks. I don't want to. I, I don't want to be a part of that. The other thing I would comment on is. The, to be careful about the either or. I don't contend that the Old Testament says that we are a part of a community and not individuals. No, we are individuals in community. And I think it's unhealthy if you, if you make the community the whole thing. Well, that's communism or, or fascism, isn't it? That, that, and you do that, and the community rolls over any individual uh, merit or virtue. The right way to think about it, in my view, and I think this is the Old Testament way, is to think of ourselves as individuals in community. That we as individuals have, have, have 
worth. I like the term worth, not the term rights. We have merit. We're worth something. Every individual on the face of the earth, now and ever before and hence to come, is in the image of God and has worth. But we don't exist. We are individual, but we don't exist individually. We, we, we are part of a family. We are part of, you know, and it goes on like that. And part of our worth and part of our being godlike is that we care about others. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. I think, I think that dividing uh, and, making, and making a choice between individual on the one hand and community on the other hand, either one of those ways leads you to some ism that is dangerous. Yeah, I was just sitting here thinking about the retribution versus rest restoration in terms of our prison um, system and what you said about the, the young boy. And I'm trying to think, um, it seems like a lot of people who would push the retribution part and the mandatory sentences and all of those things that we know have highly impacted um, justice in our, in our um, prison system. But then when I look back at the Old Testament, a lot of them would probably use the Old Testament and the eye for an eye and all of the stoning yeah. and all of that. So yeah. how, do we, how do we discuss that in a way that, you know, would, would allow for the restoration without the Old Testament retribution? Boy, part? boy howdy. I mean, I, I told you up front I was going to leave the scholar me kind of behind and every, all of these questions are just pulling, pulling them out. Here we go. That's cool. <laughs> the, the, so the eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Uh, if you compare Israelite law uh, in the Decalogue, I mean, not the Decalogue, but the Torah, <coughs> to the, say, the Babylonian or Assyrian law codes, uh, Israel is very, for its time period, very progressive. Because in the, say, the, everybody know, has heard of the Codex Hammurabi. Mm -hmm. In the Codex Hammurabi, there are three sets of laws depending on what status, civil, socioeconomic status you have. And just to give her an example, um, if you're upper class and you happen to kill a, a lower class person, somebody else's slave, uh, pay, pay a couple of mina of silver and you're, you're, you're off. You're, that's what you owe. If, on the other hand, a slave happens to uh, not even kill, let's say, uh, maim an upper-class individual, it will cost him his life. Do you, do you see what I'm there? No. And in, in that context, the Old Testament's lex talionis is a very, it insists that things be, um, how well I put it, equitable. What is an arm worth? It's worth an arm no matter what, whether you're upper class or lower class, right? It's, you don't get to do that. It's never worth more than an arm, right? So that's one aspect of that. But the, the part that is, for me, um, oh, I'm, someday if I live to be 112 and I'm still in good health the last 20 years, I'm going to translate the Old Testament myself because I get so upset. Um, if you, if you read, all the time you'll read about uh, God punishing someone, God punishing someone for their sin. It never says that in the Bible. Punishment is not a term that occurs. The Bible talks about visiting their iniquities or repaying. And it, it's interesting that if you trace it through, and I encourage you to do this sometime, you have to read the whole thing to get this. But the Israelite uh, system tended to, f if, if, uh, if you steal corn, you don't go to prison, you don't get a beating, you don't get your hand chopped off. You have to repay the corn plus some, right? So that the, so that the, uh, I want to, I don't I hesitate to call it penalty. So that the, uh, the recompense is in kind and is equitable. Do you, is everybody following what I'm saying? 
I've always wondered how do we figure out how much is it worth, how many years of your life is it worth to steal 5,000? Well, that's worth a year. How about 50,000? Well, that's worth a year and a half. How about 5 million? Well, that's worth 20 years. I don't, I don't, I don't get it, right? Never have to pay the money back. The Old Testament is much more interested in restoring and repairing the relationship and the community so that we can go on. But you have to read widely uh, to get that. I would like to talk a little bit more about your statement that the church hasn't stood up in many ways for love and community, but actually we have contributed more to the status quo and think about ways that we might find our way forward in healthier ways than what we have been lulled into. Yeah. Oh boy. (laughs) Uh, Well, um, I, I, I can say a lot of things. I'm, I'm trying to think of how to how to organize it around a simple principle, um, and I have to do it by by testifying, I guess. Um, and this will, I think, my testimony will resonate with many of you. I grew up in a time period and in a place. Listen. I was such a Southern Baptist kid, I didn't know what the Southern Baptist Convention was. I just thought every Baptist was the same kind of Baptist. I thought, what kind of Baptist is there besides the kind of Baptist I am? (laughs) That's the kind of Baptist I want. And Baptist church I grew up in, God, family, country. I mean, they were the Trinity, almost. Did you hear what I said? They were almost the Trinity. Now, God, God's okay. He can be in the Trinity. But, uh, and I love my family. Always have, always will. But, hmm, country... Oh man, and 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 the and the and the uh, and the sacraments were baseball and apple pie. I guess I don't know. Um, it, it manifested itself through. Uh, it did in those days, and it doesn't in our day with the notion that patriotism means that you just acquiesce and accept to and agree to and laud everything this country is and ever has been. And call me what you will, but I'm not that kind of patriot. We've t- I've talked about the Declaration of Independence when all men are created equal and with inalienable rights. That's exactly what Thomas Jefferson and those guys meant, men. And they didn't mean just men. They meant white men with property. Right? Mm-hmm. The, 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 the whatever amendment it was that gave women the right to vote didn't give women the right to vote. It gave white women the right to vote. If you, if you trace American history all along those lines, when someone stands up and says, this is not right, it needs to change. The church has been a conservative force for keeping things the way they were. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very rarely, and in some outposts of the church, only in some outposts, have we have we as Christians stood up for the liberating act of God, actions of activity of God in history. Now, boy, I have to watch out. I, I really can't start on this. Uh, I uh, it hurts me. I'll tell a story, uh, and if you, I hope I'm not pushing this in the ground too much. I, uh, I was, oh, I guess about a sophomore in high school when some of you may remember this, when there was a big controversy because that back then we used to still go to training union. Y'all remember that? 
and there was a training union quarterly made for the young high school age. And the cover had three teenagers walking down, <coughs> down a high school corridor. It was a good looking young white man, a white boy, a really good looking young white girl and a really good looking young black man walking down the thing to the high school students. That in the, in the preview stages caused such controversy that they yanked that quarterly and it never appeared. My goodness. I was old enough and naive enough at the time a, to notice it, and B, to think, wait a minute. This does not comport with the Jesus Loves Me stuff we sing every Sunday and with the sermons my pastor, whom I loved then and love now, preached. I will tell you, I'm convinced that part of the problem... <clears throat> hmm. Part of the problem we face in the church today is that my children's generation looks at that history and says, y'all are flat out hypocrites and I don't want any part of it. Until our actions reflect our hymns and the biblical text People are going to look at us that way, and they have good reason. Now, I said it. Mark, and I, I, I can't help but see that in light of another uh, statement you made. And I know it's there are a lot of cultural things at play, but, but this substitution or but not a better word might be perversion of righteousness to equal some sort of piety yeah. instead of doing what's right for others and whenever i think of righteousness I, I i know we're in the old testament but i think of um joseph wants to do the right thing by mary and by the baby jesus to be because he's a righteous man. That righteousness is tied to what he is going to do for his family. Right. Um, and oh, a wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and so the, the, this, this concept of, of righteousness or right living in the world is simply a God and me kind of thing. And we've forgotten about, you know, others, this, this sort of perversion of what biblical righteousness is all about. Um, I, I don't mean to distill it all to that, but that certainly <laughs> seems to be part of part of well, our I mean, our corporate church sin together. Yeah, that's right. But but it means we don't we can't we haven't we can't read the Bible very well. I mean, uh, there are ten commandments. Four of them have to do with God. Six of them have to do with how we relate to one another. Jesus was asked, "What's the great commandment?" He said, "Well, love the Lord your God with all your heart." And the second is like unto the first, to quote the King James. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I mean, it's how do you love God and mistreat someone in God's image? It, uh, it just doesn't work that way. It can't. First John, how can you say you love the Lord, love God, and hate your brother? You can't. But we don't seem to, you know, historically, we haven't caught on to that too too well. One of the conversations, I think, that centers, that, that comes out of this um, central conversation about the church being, standing up and saying this isn't right and this needs to change is everyone's desire to keep everyone Content, uh huh, yeah. Not, not not offend anybody. Nobody wants to divide yeah. to be divisive. There's a yeah. fear of of creating division, and no one wants 
that responsibility. And I understand that who wants to be responsible for that. But at the same time, it silences the voice. And that's a concern of mine. Um, yeah, it is a hard one. Um, um, all my years of teaching seminary, when I would be teaching Amos or somebody, and Daniel can attest to this, he probably remembers it. I'd be coming down pretty hard on some of these kinds of things. And some student or other would raise their hand and say, Dr. Bill, how do we do that out there in the church and, and still have, keep our jobs? Mm-hmm. And I would always say, what's your problem? No, I would say, um, uh, I encourage young ministers to earn the right first. I mean, uh, when, 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 when the, and I think this applies to the church or to parts of the church. When you can demonstrate over time that you are in this relationship for the good of the relationship and for the good of the other, then you can say and do things on, on the strength of that. I mean, let me give an, let me give a simple example. If, if, if I were afraid to say to my wife, that stew was not so good. Don't cook it again. If I were afraid that that would end in divorce, then I don't have a very good relationship. It's not very strong. Uh, but if, if you've built a relationship that's strong, you can say more than that. You can say more disturbing things than that. And the relationship will survive. It might be, there might be this a little bit, but it won't come apart. And I don't think the church, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't put skin in the game very much. I, I hate to sound like I'm anti-church because I'm not. And if you think I am, I need to correct that now. I am by the church the way I am by this country. If, the United States lived up to its ideals, it would be something, it is already something in the world. It could be something else altogether. Wonderful. The church, there's nothing wrong with the church in concept. (coughs) And as I said, the church I grew up in sang and preached the right things. We just didn't seem to believe them with the level of activity, right? We could confess them, but we couldn't do them. And if we'll start doing in the world what we say, oh, just oh, just 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 stand back and watch what will happen. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but we have a hard time with that. Uh, we can say all the right things forevermore. I liken it to people who are willing to put money in the offering plate to to help with children who need tutoring, for example, but won't spend 30 minutes helping some young person learn how to read. It, it's it, What matters is when you get your hands in it, right? That's when things begin to change. But put another way, when what you say is matched by what you do. That's why I said, it's so important to realize that it's about an act, action, not a status. I, I had one more question that I, I I hesitated to ask because I thought it was kind of off, off topic, but maybe it gives you an opportunity to wrap things up and come back to the beginning. Um, I really look forward to seeing that translation of the Old Testament that you're, you're going to Yeah, hear. if I have time. Because you know. quite... Because uh, sincerely, uh, Bonnie knows this from from my Sunday school class. There are so many words that are mistranslated, not necessarily mistranslated, but just, you know, uh, the Hebrew just doesn't get to the English all that well. Uh, and, sometimes it's hard, yeah. yeah and, and what is that word for justice? And, yeah, uh, and I can't pronounce it. You've pronounced it before, and, and there's spittle all over the, the place when you pronounce it. And, there, and, there, what, and, and how, how is it translated, and what does it all mean? Okay. Uh, it's a little Hebrew lesson. Well, it's actually a Semitic language lesson. This applies to Arabic and all of Semitic languages. 
One of the reasons that um, uh, we in the West have, have English speakers have such a hard time learning Hebrew is because the whole foundation of it is the whole system is founded on a different way of thinking and doing. The verbs operate differently. There's no tense. One of the things that um, characterizes Semitic languages that is really kind of wonderful is that every, every uh, mm, how, how to put this, there are groupings of three letters and they represent a concept. And depending on how you supply vowels and suffixes and prefixes to them, you can take them into nouns or verbs or adjectives or abstract nouns. The three letters here are, um, well, for lack of, we'll call it a Z, although it's pronounced like a T-S, T-S D, and Q. So we have the word tzedek, which means rightness. We have the word tzaddik, which means a righteous person. We have the word tzedakah, which means righteousness. It's the abstract noun. Yitzdak means I behaved righteously. And it goes on like that. Those three letters have to do with uprightness, uh, justness, straightness, all of those kinds of ideas. In Hebrew, you just can tax it. Amen, Daniel. You can just tack all kind of stuff on there. Amen, Bert. You can just do whatever you want to with it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if you know how. Uh, I don't know how helpful that was, but you find it um, in a lot of in a lot of contexts. Uh, one of the things that's interesting in Hebrew is they do things in parallelism. So you'll find one of these words in parallel with either a word that means upright or a word that means peace. I talk about peace being more than just quiet, about being wholesome, wholeness. It's a wonderful word. Well, let me do it. Let me do it. Let me do a preview. preview. Next week, uh, we're going to turn to the New Testament. And I want to tell you one of the things that varies automatically anytime you go from the Old Testament to the New is that the Old Testament is set in the context of the life of a people, which was a nation. The New Testament is set in the life of a people, which is a church scattered abroad throughout the empire with no ethnic identity per se, with no ruling, there are no king of the church. There are no boundaries to the church. There's no ethnicity in the church. And so uh, righteousness takes on some interesting new flavors. And we'll look at that next week. So much, Dr. Bill. We will look well, forward to that. And, um, I look forward to it too. Absolutely. And you've given us a lot to think about, things that we may continue um, talking about with one another before we gather again. And I certainly thank you so much for your time this evening. I enjoyed it very much. Look forward to okay. next week.